All right. Well, we were talking about in chapter five of uh, First Timothy last week. We just got the first the first couple of verses read and talked about how uh, Paul was instructing Timothy on essentially to, to take care of everyone and. And since Timothy's a younger man, he was telling him essentially how to relate to everyone. The older older men and the older women relate to them as mothers and fathers. The younger men and women think of them as 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 sisters and, and brothers. And, uh, and 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 so really and truly, everyone in the church is a member of your family, and you're all there together. And and don't neglect anyone. Uh, it seems to be part of the message there. But then. After that, the Apostle Paul goes into a very lengthy discussion on widows. And, and, and it, did, it just interests me, and I think about it, why in the world does he feel as though it is so necessary to spend so much time when it seems like such a clear command that the church and that Christians are supposed to take care of the less fortunate, and we know that in that society, for sure, that widows were, were really the bottom of the barrel when it came to, to uh, where they you know, placed it in the structure. And yet, Paul seems to put an awful lot of um, caveats here and, and, and concern about how the church approaches that need or approaches taking care of them. I mean, if you, you realize it, that we talked about back in, some time ago when we were doing the book of Acts, that really the, the first issue that sprung up within the early church were those who were in need that were not being taken care of. And they were essentially widows who were not getting what they needed every day in order to, to, to get by. And so that's where we think that it seems like the first deacons came about was to help distribute what was needed where it needed to go. But now at this point, we have Paul just really going into an awful lot of, of description and an awful lot of of thought as to how we qualify and quantify and make the decisions uh, to, to help. And, and so as we read some of this, I'm gonna, we'll, we'll, we'll pause and, and, and <coughs> discuss a little bit, um, but it seems as though there's not just a broad brush approach that says, if someone's a widow, you should do this. And uh, we'll discuss some of that and maybe why the, the need is there for so much discussion. So let's just go ahead and get into uh, the Word of God here this morning, starting with verse 3 in, uh, in chapter 5 of 1 Timothy. And he says, Honor widows who are truly widows. And that right there tells you that there is to, to, to be a little bit of a, uh, a filter put on when you're looking at those who are coming to your door and saying, We are widows and we need help. Verse 4, he said, But if a widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show godliness to their own household and to make some return to their parents, for this is pleasing in the sight of God. She who is truly a widow, left all alone, has set her hope on God and continues in supplications and prayers night and day. But she who is self-indulgent is dead even while she lives." Command these things as well, so that they may be without approach. But if anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially for members of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. So it starts off with this, this concern about um, if a widow has children or grandchildren, then, then let them first learn to show godliness to their own household and make some return to their parents for this is pleasing in the sight of God. So there, there seems to be this, this desire in what Paul is writing that first and foremost, family takes care of family. That's where the first line of help should be coming from. So if, you know, I guess I, I, I ask this question because every time I read through this, my, my brain keeps coming up with these, well, what if? Well, what if? And... And then I'll notice here down in verse 9, just to read that real quickly, he says, Let a widow be enrolled if she is not less than 60 years of age, having been the husband of one wife and having a reputation for good works. If she has brought up children, has shown hospitality, has washed the feet of the saints, has cared for the afflicted, and has devoted herself to every good work. Wow. 
What does enroll mean? That's the word I was going to back and focus on. <laughs> because it sounds as if, and I've looked at some commentaries on this, and maybe, uh, maybe you all would have something to add. It sounds as if enrolled is saying that this person becomes a, a servant within the church, not necessarily a staff member, but, but is, is serving and working and dedicating, the, essentially dedicating their life to the Lord in service and in all good works. And then the church is not paying, but supporting and helping and providing for this woman as time moves on. And so it's more than somebody comes and knocks on the door and says, hey, I need help with the electric bill this month. It's more than somebody who says, hey, I don't have food in my pantry this, this week. It is, it's a, it's a tighter, deeper relationship. And so mentally, at least, I'm separating the, the, the help of the people who need something once or twice or just through its season. This is someone who is not likely to remarry. This is someone who... Um, you know, is in a situation of being being much older, doesn't have family to support them, and is a is a certain kind of becomes a certain kind of dedicated individual. Now, now that's maybe perhaps I'm wrong on that, but it, but uh, but when I ask the question to myself again, why is there such need for so much discussion on this? It it seems as if we are saying that we are really taking this person in. And this person is going to provide service to the church in ministry throughout. Discussion? What do, you, what do y'all think? So to me, be keeping <coughs> being a crutch too much for people who aren't willing to help themselves. Kind I think that's a big like part of it. The guidelines to you know, not keep supporting someone who's not willing to also serve themselves and, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. Because if, you, if you're in a situation where you don't have family... You can't get a job, you know. You're 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 the least of the least of the lowest. Then then, what work are you going to do? How would you how, how could you do anything? Beg, beg. Yeah, that's really that's, that's right. Their option. Yeah. yeah, you wind up you wind up on the streets. You wind up begging. You wind up asking. But if you're willing to be in service, then the church can become your source of what you need. Outside of the Old Testament, you don't hear a lot about ages. I don't know. Is sixty was that a stretch for a lot of people? I don't know about that. Time, the, you know how late you live. The best it. interpretation that I can get from that is is while it may not be considered all that old today, certainly it, it, that it, in that particular time frame and structure, the chances of them remarrying were not very good. I would and that. certainly they're not be not going to be having a family. And so, if they find themselves in that situation at that early at, 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 at that age, then it's highly unlikely that they're going to have anybody take care of them moving forward. But again, if you look at what was that's Sarah or uh, like look at Noah's age, she's a spring chicken, right? Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. She's a lot of nine hundred. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. She's just coming in her prime. <laughs> Yeah, you got the, my goodness, 30 more years, you can still have a kid. Yeah. Yeah, so. I think at this time, I think at this time they were very similar to our, our lifespans and lifespans. Yeah, it just kind of diminished after the flood. It did. It just continued to let down. And I used to think that, I used to think that if you lived 200 years ago, because if you ever looked at the lifespan uh, average, it was like 40 some years over. I used to think like those people ran themselves into the ground pretty quick. Mm -hmm. But I found out that that's only because the infant mortality uh, was so high that ah. that actually skewed the numbers. Like mm -hmm. so, it was if you if you live past childhood, you know. Oh, well, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. The, the chances of you living to the same ages as we lived, our lifespan would be very similar. But it was the fact that infant mortality was just so high. That's a, that's the average that sense. statistics, man. It's yeah, yeah. They really yeah. I had I'd never thought of that before. Huh. But yeah, if you have if you have a high number of of uh, you know, infant mortalities, and when you walk through the graveyards, uh, you see that from yeah. that time period. Yeah. And then you can certainly see how that would uh, how that would, would bend things in the wrong direction, it moves the curve. That's how a lot of infant baptism got started because the, there was so yeah. much death loss with <laughs> infants that the just out of desperation and panic, yeah. mostly. But I mean, there were other reasons too, but that was a big one. I think this enroll. I think this is just a. Prior, 
monetization of need uh, within the church. You know, like uh, you think about Lois Skidmore. She's a widow, right? Yeah. But she has John. Now, if we had another woman who, I can't think of any off the top of my head, who who's a widow, same age, that doesn't have family around here, as much as we hate to admit it, she needs more help than Lois, you know? Uh, I think that's really all that's going on. <clears throat> but we also, well... I think that's much of what's going on. Like I said, it talks about the fact that it warns the, the younger widows not to do this because they mm-hmm. are taking some kind of... Seems like they are taking some kind of a lifelong oath. It, it, it does and seem like end. there might be more to it than that. <laughs> but, yeah. and, but again, life and times, we don't, we're not dealing with the same, you know, I mean, somebody that's 60, 70, 80 even is not dealing with the same things that somebody in that culture had to deal with. No, because you know, they life is different. Opportunities, yeah. mm-hmm. Very mom, different. My mom just got a job at 70, she's 73. Mm-hmm. 73. She went back to work just because she was bored. So uh, <laughs> my father had passed away a year ago and she, you know, she wanted to do something. She wanted to do something. Yeah. There wasn't a whole lot of Walmart readers back then. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. That's right. <laughs> Although I think some may have been in training. They could. <laughs> <Yeah. So. laughs> no, you're right. It was a, it was definitely a different a different time period. And uh, um there, and you're right, as we, as we read on here, we're going to find all of these, these things that are talked about with the younger widows. Uh, because obviously, you can become a widow at any age that you were married. Uh, there's so much going on with famine and disease and, and wars, and you, know, you, you, you can go down the list. And it's really not that much different from, from today um, when that things can happen. And they did happen. Uh, but yet, does it, does it not seem, especially once we read... Uh, and we've talked about how certainly it's, it's clear that, that if you have a family to take care of you, the family should be taking care of you first and foremost. Um, isn't it, uh, isn't yeah. it um, interesting, though, before you even get past verse 8, or there, he's putting a big emphasis. It's almost, you know, don't even just think about widows here. If there's a strong message about serving your own family. It says you're worse than an unbeliever. Worse than an unbeliever. And it makes you think of, you know, we see it all over the place. People that kind of disown their families or something and that and some have legitimate reason, you know, if there was an abusive relationship or something, but the turning your back on your family is a parents it's very displeasing yeah. to the Lord. It is, it is, it is really hit hard here when you see Paul, write That, that you are worse, that he is worse than an unbeliever. If he doesn't take care of his, of his family, especially the members of his own household. Um, you know, and, and I don't, you like to think that there's, a, that there's allowance for special circumstances, mm-hmm. but um, I, I guess, how do I put this? I don't know that, that we have any right to, to, you know, to try and judge or look for <coughs> Special circumstances. Um, it, it's, it's each situation is its own situation. But it, it, it kind of connects. It's a, look. This is that's where you see this is the same God, Old Testament, New. He said in Ten Commandments, "Honor thy mother and thy father." And it still holds true. It still holds true. It's this is yeah, yeah. It still it does still hold true. Verse that was not lost. You had said children and grandchildren. King James says children or even nephews. So or even nephews, huh? even out past <coughs> your immediate. <laughs> that was yeah, yeah. If you've got if you if you've got anybody still alive who's part of your family, it sounds like their responsibility is to be take help and take care of you. And there's there's a lot to be said for that. That these days, family is. We are right in the church to be putting as much emphasis as we can on the family structure, and and not not because of the, you know any secular reasoning, but when you when you go back to the Old Testament and take a look in Deuteronomy and and see the importance that was put upon teaching God's word within the family structure. If you don't have the family structure. I mean, that's, 
you hear a lot of talk oftentimes about how we need to figure out how do we reach people. We need to figure out what's the right way to 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 get the, the word of God to be spread from person to person, from generation to generation. God put that in place already. That was the family. The family's job was to teach the word of God and to do this all the time. Now, admittedly, structure gets broken. And yes, as a church, we have to, we have to reach people. But we are right to focus upon the emphasis of the family structure, whatever structure may be left of a family, to, to emphasize that you need to hold it together and stay together. And there's so much scripture to go back to that shows the importance of the family structure. And then to emphasize that it's your job, not the church's job, but it's your job as parents to, to, to make sure that your children know the word of God and understand the scriptures. And part of that is bringing them to church, but not offloading that responsibility onto the church, which is a, which is a big problem these days. I have talked to parents who have absolutely no idea about anything within scripture. And they are so lost as to what to do and how to do it. But their, their, their solution is, I bring my child to church. I bring my child to Wednesday night children's ministry or Awana or whatever we may be having and drop them off and say, I want them to know God. But at home, nothing transpires. And that's, the, that's such a big missing piece uh, of, of, of t- keeping that next generation going and putting them in the right direction. We're talking about care. We we're on Wednesdays. We're going over Ruth, and you know that's. Dang, the, you stole my point. Go ahead, go. Go. No, no, no. You got it. I would eat a peek before I would say anything. <laughs> <laughs> now you go. That's a bluff. <laughs> yeah. Hammer down. Hammer down about Ruth walking to Bethlehem with her mother-in-law, the widow. Maybe you should both talk. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking. I'm thinking that's where my child is headed right now. No, please, please go. No, I was, just, I was just gonna say. I mean, the fact that the Kinsman Redeemer was put in place, you know, by God to take care of your. I mean, imagine your nephew or something. You know, and, and again, you have the Kinsman Redeemer, but you also had. Uh, put in place that if a, if a close family member had lost uh, their their entire estate, you know, for whatever reason, sickness or death or whatever, that if you had the means that you were to buy it back and mm-hmm. give it back to yeah. you, you know what I mean? How, much, how many of us would be like, what? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I could do what with my money now? You know, but it was, again, a whole different culture. We're, you know, we're laying out uh, currently at work first century Jerusalem and the houses are just on top of each other, on top of each other, on top of each other, on top of each other. Like, you know what I mean? Like, there just was no space between you and your family. Like, generation after generation after generation, you were, you were living within the same, you know, block. Yeah, and, I can see that. And, and same household and stuff. So it was just a whole different culture than we're, we're used to. So. Stepping off of that, though, we, I was listening to a sermon, and we were on Ruth, and the pastor kind of pulled four points out of it regarding finances and how our money isn't even our money. It's yeah. all God's money it's all God's first. Money. Yeah. So, you know, yeah, even that would be our in- first instinct to say Everything we have <laughs> is not ours. Yeah. Even though that's a hard concept to... Like, it's, oh, what, isn't it? Well, I work yeah. for it. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. No, but you're right. And that's, that's something we need to always to stop and remind ourselves. And I'll tell you, there are times when, when I get that reminder given to me in not such a good way and it hits you pretty hard because you say wow i've been i've been going selfishly all this time and then a few months later it happens again mm-hmm. and you realize I, I lost it again and i was I, I completely forgot this all belongs to god and i am a steward of it and and what am i doing um and and then i, I promise you i'll forget it again because yeah. I get, i'll get wrapped up and lost and <laughs> working every day and and planning every day and, and worrying every day um, and it's it's not how it was meant to be not only that's a great great point thanks for bringing that up that <laughs> that that we we uh, look what you said that you know it's what what do you mean take my take my resources and buy it back and, yeah. and give are you kidding me but then again you know this is God's money this is God's money 
Now, what, what, what were you going to say? Uh, well, I was just going to touch on... Because I don't think you guys had the same point. No, I was just going to say that Ruth, you know, Naomi was a widow. Well, Ruth was a widow too, but Ruth chose, you know, Naomi was her mother-in-law and she chose to devote, really devote her life to the God of Israel and to wherever Naomi went, you know, as a, as a, as a daughter-in-law. It's pretty bold. That's, that's way on yes. down. Yes. That's way on that. But she had no, she had no one else, so... Well, plus when she got back to Bethlehem, she went to work yeah. to help provide yeah. for her mother-in-law. Yeah, so, and could. Right. Yeah, she yeah. essentially adopted Naomi as, you know, well, I mean, they were family. But yeah. Uh, she yeah. went a radical path to love uh, this widow and was rewarded for it. So. We're not there yet, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. We'll get there in a couple of weeks. <laughs> it's coming down well, the I don't have to come this one. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, we won't be there this one. So, ah, yeah. so, yeah. so, be, so you're right. Join, join, him, him, join him in Florida if you'd like to. Yes. Yeah. 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 That's great. We'll meet on Zoom. We all show up. <laughs> no, we're all showing up on the beach. So, and you're going to be like, oh, man. Hey, I, love, <laughs> I love Bible studies over Zoom. So. <laughs> Oh, that's terrible. I didn't enjoy it, but, <laughs> but we did it. I went a couple Wednesday nights over Zoom. We're, we're here. It was, uh, oh, yeah. Boy, those days are gone, thankfully. Mm -hmm. um, so, but I want to go back to something that Crystal said about, um, uh, if, I, if I heard you right about enabling, mm -hmm. or, or uh, there are two, I think there are two points to, to be considered. One is that these guidelines are, are put in place to prevent enabling those who have their own means, whether it's to provide for themselves or have families. Um, but they're also, they also seem to be put in, put in place um, to try to keep the church from basically being drained dry. I mean, if, and, and this is why, and, and take not, not to argue, but this is why I'll go back to the word enrolled. The reason why I, I feel like there may be a little more to it is that if you're going to take on supporting someone at a certain <laughs> level, is if they're ministering and helping within the church, then the church is getting is getting something back. Not not that you know it has to be a give and take situation, but it, it almost feels like the way he's describing this, and I think it's it's certainly open for a lot of discussion. But it feels like the way he's describing this is that. <clears throat> That if we're going to take on taking care of you, then there are needs within the church that you can serve and, and fulfill and be a part of. And, and so everybody wins, if you will, uh, in that type of a relationship. But, it, but, it, but it, I think this is all uh, a, a whole bunch of precautionary things that, one, we don't want to enable. And two, if the church takes all of its resources to try and take care of every widow out there, there has to be some criteria to decide whether or not this person should be someone that we take care of. And that's what I meant by the prioritization. Mm. Uh, gotcha. Struggling with that word. Well, and there you go. On the work side of it, they are, in, in a sense, they are working for it. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and again, back to the Ruth study, you notice they didn't just give handouts to the poor. They allowed them opportunities to work, to gather and glean in the fields. So... It wasn't, true. it wasn't ever, you know, just a strict handout. And that's the other thing, too, when you mention <coughs> this with it, as far as spiritually, the church, if, if it takes on all of, of the needs of where the family should be doing the work, that's spiritually robbing, you know, them of a chance to Absolutely. Really just grow and use their gifts. So, yes. Yeah. You know, I was just kind of about on that same path and this could be a stretch. I think there's a lot of, <coughs> there's an unspoken uh, undertone in Paul's message here of our God that he knows our propensity to suffer loss and self-loathe and, <laughs> and want to call it quits. And I think God cannot continue to work through you if you call call it quits. He has other things in mind that you can't fathom yet because he sees you two, three decades down the road and what can be spun about through 
And, and it's kind of, and again, to keep harping on Ruth, you know. So Ruth didn't give up and self loathe And from that comes David's lineage continued, which serves to the Messiah. You know, but there's, we, we want to self loathe And I guess he's saying, you know, uh, if you're 60 or above and you're kind of at the end of where you can serve in that capacity, then it, okay, but. Don't give up, you know. There's going to be trying times. There's going to be hard things. And we all want to just, woe is me. And, and yeah, actually, that's, that's interesting because you're, you're correct. That's uh, <laughs> We all find ourselves in that situation. And, you know, uh, those even those who are strongest in the faith sometimes get to a, a point of self-loathing and, and, and will we'll want to just kind of wallow around in self-pity. And, uh, and it's an easy thing to do. But... I was looking back here at, at verse 9 again, and all of these things. Um, let a widow be enrolled if she is not less than 60 years old, uh, having been the wife of one husband. So, so there's, some, there's some, some qualifications put here on, on how, how did she live her life in marriage? Um, did she have a reputation for good works? Did she, did, did she bring up children? Has she shown hospitality? Um, and this, this verse here, this, these words here, has washed the feet of the saints, Wearsby points out, don't think of that as some sort of a ritual. Think of that as she was willing to put herself in the position of the lowest of servants and wash the feet of those who you know, who came to the house. And and that's that's not considered to be a, a task. For, you know, that's why Jesus washed their feet to show that he was that he was there to serve. Um, and so, so Paul puts that in here as a, as, as a way to look at what type of a woman is she, has cared for the afflicted and has devoted herself to every good work. But then in verse 11, this is where things start to get a little bit negative. Refuse to enroll younger widows, for when their passions draw them away from Christ, they desire to marry and so incur condemnation for having abandoned their former faith. Besides that, they learn to be idlers going about from house to house, and not only idlers, but also gossips and busybodies, saying that they should saying what they should not. So I would have younger widows marry, bear children, manage their households, and give the adversary no occasion for slander. So there's this whole look at if you're young enough to to go ahead and do what you're called to do to serve and, and manage a household and get married and have children and get that family in place, then the Apostle Paul is saying that's, that's what we would have you do as opposed to as a younger person moving into this being enrolled within the church because there's all kinds of room for issue there. And, and that's, that's not a politically correct thing to say. It, it even feels, it feels off base from what we talk about these days because we're essentially saying, and I mean, it's the truth, right? That, that not just women, but, but certainly everyone of a certain age, <coughs> attractions exist, things happen, and it happens at all ages, but more so with a certain age group. And Paul was just warning about if you, if you allow young women to come in, and you just, just because... If your only criteria is, oh, you lost your husband, if that's all we're going to do to look at to decide whether or not we should put you here, then we may be opening the church up to a lot of problems and putting that person in a situation where they just shouldn't be. And, and so his warning to Timothy is, Let, let's pay attention to where the young widows are and, and not open these doors for the problems that may come about. The main criteria seems to be spiritual maturity. It really does seem to be, doesn't it? Because even if you're if you're older, that does not necessarily give you an instant ticket into that. You there's qualifications just like the deacons and the elders had qualifications for serving within the church that they have they fall under, you know, similar guidelines. Yeah, and, and, and I'll, I'll I'll agree with you to that to the point that that the sixty years old comes into play. Right. Yeah, and and so then once you once you look at the, the at their age, okay, well they're they're past the point where these things can happen for them. Then how are they spiritually mature? 
what kind of life have they lived and how can they serve and there's there's a lot to and again and i don't think that this is saying we that we we can't help those who have instances or seasons of need this is more taking them on yeah. you know right uh what i think off there 15. thank you for some have already strayed after satan if any believing woman has relatives who are widows let her care for them let the church not be burdened so that it may so that it may care for those who are truly widows do you get the point do you get the feeling here that that paul is saying that a widow is way more than someone who's just lost a husband because he keeps saying truly widows and I, I i want to know because i don't think our definition of widow would go past someone who's lost their husband I, I mean, he's, he's trying to spell out how he sees it, but that word really seems to take on more, a lot more connotation than you just lost your husband. They have no one. Uh, yeah, I think, you know, that's, that's a good, that's a good, <laughs> idea. you literally have no one and no means. Yeah. You have no one and no means. It also talks in my um, commentary about the younger women who could possibly be led astray by um, false teachers or marry oh. men who are non-believers and therefore spread yeah. false teaching. Yeah, that's a whole other aspect. <laughs> yeah, there's just there's just so much there to be concerned about. And and so Paul was trying to, to warn Timothy of what can happen, it sounds like. But at the same time, also give him guidance as to what direction to lead those people into um, as they come up. And they will come up. Yeah, it's pretty strong to say, but refuse. Yes. To enroll younger widows. Yeah, I mean that is a that is a put your foot down kind of thing. It sure is. Verse seventeen: Let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor. So now he shifts gears a little bit and starts talking about about elders who are in the position of, of leadership, and and I, I still tend to to see this. Um, probably when we're talking about elders as as those who this may be a little bit like the structure in a lot of churches today where you have a senior pastor and you have a family pastor and you have a you know pastor children and, and whatever uh, Jordan and I used to joke about this when he was here he used to say yeah you know they even have a pastor of pickles so they have pastors for everything these days and, and they kind of do but it also sounds biblical to me that you had people who were in certain roles that that did see after certain areas within the church um, and but in this case they're saying that essentially you need to take care of those who are in leadership within the church um, they're considered worthy of double honor especially those who labor in preaching and teaching for the scripture scripture says you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain and the, the laborers deserve his wages. So quoting, quoting Christ. But there, there's definitely a, a biblical um, foundation here that Paul brings up, not just here, but in other places within his writings, that it is the church's responsibility to take care of those who are serving in leadership roles, in pastor roles, um, not just staff members who, who may be you know, for providing necessary services to the church, but for especially those who labor in preaching and teaching that, um, you know, as I was brought up um, in, in my house, it was a, a constant thing that for whatever reason, a discussion would come up about working on Sunday. And and and, and I'm not going to open that door for that discussion right now, but... but then somebody would always come back and say, well, the preacher's working on Sunday and he's getting paid. So what does that mean? And there was, there would, we would, I remember these discussions in the house and this, and there are people I've talked to who believe for whatever reason that, well, you're not supposed to, to work on Sunday. So why is a preacher getting paid? And shouldn't he have another job to support himself? Why should the service of the Lord result in you being paid? Well, because essentially that's the job you have taken on. And the scripture says that those people who are serving in those roles, who have been called to be there, you, the church needs to support them because they're supporting the church. 
It's a reciprocal relationship, and there's nothing wrong with it. It's just like the Levites. You know, they were taken care of by the people. They didn't have their own land. Their their job was to serve God. Yeah. And therefore, the people that essentially took care of them. And so you, you see that here, and the structure the structure makes sense, and, and I don't think there's any argument uh, that can be made against taking care of those who take care of uh, the church. So, but... Then we start to get into um, <coughs> church discipline to some extent here with regard to, to elders. In verse 19, he says, Do not admit a charge against an elder except on the evidence of two or three witnesses. As for those who persist in sin, rebuke them in the presence of all for or so that the rest may stand in fear. Um, that's, that's not really any different than what we've read before with regard to, to how the church is to, to deal with things, but the certainly the wording here with how you know we're going to publicly address this and deal with this um, so that the rest may stand in fear. Uh, you know, there's nothing there there's nothing wrong with letting people know about punishment that occurs for a specific violation so that others may look at it and say, I better not do that either. And there's nothing wrong with it in, in, in culture. There's nothing wrong with it in the church. And, and these words here are, I mean, we've had, we've had multiple discussions in here with regard to, to church discipline and, and the approach to things. And I think you've, you've preached on it and, and talked about it. And it still feels like something that, is just so out of sync with where we are today and with how we approach things and do things with our with our tolerant attitudes when it comes to everything but it's not it's not scriptural yeah this all this is really just expectations i mean from a church leader paul to a church leader timothy it's just a list of expectations like, hey let's not get distracted helping people that are going to go end up doing whatever they want to do anyway. We give up. We give all our. We dedicate time and money and effort and energy to this widow that's going to go marry a non-believer. We're just we're we're spinning our wheels. Same with same with these elders. You know, uh, be considered worthy of double honor until he's in unrepentant sin, and then call him out. For call him it. out. You know, for this it. is yeah. just a list of expectations. Like we're going to care for this widow who has lived a faithful, godly life. Who has no one else? She is one who is truly a widow. She's lived a life of faith. She needs our help. She has nobody else. She's enrolled at this point. Or whatever, whatever. And this is, it's also it's very much in the context of the church itself, right? Yeah. I mean, it's yeah. it's, it's not because Jesus was. I don't care if you're a, if you're talking about sinners. You're to go out and be with the sinners and message to the sinners and. You, you know, if you deny a sinner, you've denied me. You, you know, but this is for sure, right? I mean, I'm, I mean, this is I, all for the benefit well, of this the church. is for you know, yeah, as an institution, institution. Yeah. right? Right. Yeah. Just like this, this point talking about the, the elders would be the you know those who are teaching. That was a position that was that was very much honored and desired, and so it was very much a warning to those who would seek after a position like that who would not be qualified to not do so and that they would suffer the same type of, of rebuke and, and you know, challenge. Yes. Well, and as far as that goes, I mean, it, in my commentary, again, it speaks of, it's kind of a protection for those elders in that you can't just be like, oh, well, he said, or she, they did this, one person saying it. You have to have it investigated. Two people have to do it. So it's the, the same, right? Yeah. It's yeah. the same all the way around as far as that goes, but it protects them from just frivolous kind of like accusations that mean nothing, except somebody was mad because yeah. of some reason. <laughs> Knowing that when you get a group of people together, that doesn't happen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's another thing that's obviously changed. <laughs> no, it's funny. Yeah. Yeah. What a fallen world it was. Yeah. Oh, wow. 
<laughs> well, I think uh, we'll, we'll stop there for the day and pick up next week and continue on. Uh, thanks, uh, y'all, for the discussion. And would you make that count? Oh, people sure. over here because Sue's not here and I think I counted 14. Oh, did you count? Wow, thank you. I counted little baby boy back there. You should yeah. count. <laughs> Absolutely. He learned something, surely. Yeah. What'd you learn today? Don't eat the peeps. Don't eat the peeps. I like peeps. He's going to be terrified. He's going to be Real quickly, right there, since right I wasn't yeah. here, praises for the sunshine and all the things are blooming. I'm just in heaven. Um, a, and praises that I have parents who are still here and can help me, and I'm borrowing their vehicle because mine is broke down again. So just pray that it's not something serious again because I just dropped $900 on it just a few weeks ago. So. Sometimes but praises is. that I have parents who let me borrow their vehicle. And, Amen. You know, so they school gone, you can use it, but it's hard. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, right. it might make it out of you know, say, Every it time my car breaks anyway. down, Steve is always out of town. I call Betsy oh, and I'm yeah. like, help me. She's like, girl, he's gone again. <laughs> <laughs> so. Oh, yeah. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. All right. Well, thank you for that. Uh, let's remember, remember those things in prayer and uh, certainly if, uh, grateful for the day. Um, let's go ahead and close with word prayer here. And Heavenly Father, we thank you for our discussion today. And Lord, we thank you for your word and preserving it for us so that we can sit here as we've done today and, and just discuss these things. But, but, but through it, um, just draw our, ourselves closer to you. And uh, Lord, keep us in the word each day. Help us to, to, to set aside time to sit down and, and, and read these words and and to come to you in prayer for understanding and uh, to be aware of the Holy Spirit in our lives and to take, to take the guidance that, that, uh, that he provides for us. Uh, Lord, we're grateful for the things that have been mentioned this morning. And uh, we thank you so much for the blessings that we see. And uh, Lord, we just ask and hope and pray that, uh, you'll just, that we'll feel your presence as we leave this room and enter into the sanctuary. Lord, just prepare our hearts for worship. And thank you again for all you've done in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.